Today we are going to discuss the importance of solar power. You will learn why we need alternative forms of energy, how solar panels work, before answering our question, what is the biggest problem with solar power? We will then go on to discuss two new types of battery technology, before at the end we discuss if enough can be done in time. Date, 26th of March 2067, six weeks after the old ride up. We've now hit rock bottom. If only we had listened to Dr Bouchard when he first informed us how fast oil was running out, and it would never be certain when it would. Professor Burroughs warned us that CO2 levels were already over 400 parts per million and were only going to increase. But like a shining light sent from heaven itself, Dr Jones gave us the answer. In the words of the great man himself, the earth absorbs more energy in one hour than the world uses in a year. Three great men then turned to one another and knew they were destined to save the world. Little did they know that only after just beginning down their path, they would be captured by BP, ExxonMobil and PetroChina, moving to the dark side, never to be seen again. This is a solar cell. There are two different types of silicon, n-type and p-type. The n-type has an excess of electrons due to its doping from phosphorus, whereas the p-type has a deficiency of electrons due to its doping from boron. There is also a depletion layer between the two types of silicon where there are no free mobile charge carriers. There are also metal conducting strips which conduct electrons away, therefore producing electricity. So Dan, how exactly does a solar cell work? So when the two different types of silicon come together in a photovoltaic cell, electrons move from electron-rich n-type into electron-deficient p-type. This creates a positive charge in the n-type and negative charge in p-type. Electrons move across until an equilibrium state is reached, but no more electrons move due to a repulsion in the negative p-type silicon. The imbalance in charge in the photovoltaic cell creates a drying force for electrons to flow. So when a photon of light from the sun hits a silicon atom in the p-type silicon, an electron is released due to the phenomenon known as the photoelectric effect. However, the photon of light needs to have or exceed a certain amount of energy for the electron to release from the silicon atom. This energy is known as the threshold energy. So when an electron is released, it flows to the n-type silicon, which is positively charged. This creates a current and therefore electricity. According to Shockley and Kezia, the maximum efficiency of a single PN junction is 44%. Firstly, this is due to solar cells not effectively absorbing the whole of the electromagnetic spectrum. Secondly, bodies emit heat, thus energy, in the black body radiation effect. Lastly, excited electrons can undergo recombination. However, the biggest problem facing solar cells at the moment is the inefficient storage of energy when the solar cell is not active. A breakthrough <laughs> battery technology is thus needed. One of the first molten metal batteries with promising results is the antimony magnesium battery from MIT. This is how it works. Magnesium, antimony and salt are all melted and the battery runs at about 700 degrees. When liquid, they separate into three immiscible layers with different densities so that there's a magnesium layer at the top, a molten salt layer in the middle and an antimony layer at the bottom. When, when it's discharged, the magnesium is oxidised to Mg2+, which moves into the molten salt layer, moves through, and then is reduced to form a magnesium antimony alloy in the bottom. When it's recharged, the exact opposite happens and the battery is reformed. My battery technology is the flow cell. I first describe the structure of the flow cell, then go on to how it works. This here is a flow cell. Here's a catalyte more negative electroactive element to dissolve the solution. There's also an analyte, it's a more positive electroactive element to dissolve the solution. There are two conducting electrodes and a membrane for ion exchange. So, how it works. When the flow cell is discharging, the catalyte, when it's flowing into the reaction cell, releases an electron, goes into the electric circuit, does useful work, and flows to the analyte. The, the analyte gains an electron, so therefore it's reduced. And, a mem and an ion moves across the membrane, maintain charge neutrality. 
when the flow cell is charging, work is applied on an external power source, which then oxidizes the analyte, so it releases the electron, it's transverse to the electric circuit, and then it reduces the catalyte. The oxidation state is catalyte and analyte, and now in the less stable ox oxidation states, so they want to go the other way, so will when they can. So, Dan, um, Richie, I agree that we need new research into new types of battery technology. But at the moment, which of your batteries is more efficient? I'll start with you then. Well, the current density of my battery is around 200 milliamps per centimetre squared. It also has a relative efficiency of about 70%. Relative efficiency is how much energy you put in, how much energy you get out. These are slightly less than Richie's battery, but obviously my battery is still new, still has saved productions, and hasn't been fully optimised yet. And the molecules used can be changed to change the redox potentials and solubilities, which will increase these two numbers. I mean, an example of a newer molten metal battery than the one I previously discussed is the, uh, the lithium and lead antimony alloy battery. Um, that does have a higher um, current density than the Duke. How much? But How much? By 50 milliampers per centimetre squared. Yes. yes, but other metals, for example, a technetium and um, bismuth battery show charge densities of 1,000 milliampers per centimetre squared. And yes, the costs were high, but this is still in the production stages, as you say, and lots can be done to bring costs down and, you know, create a better battery. So Dan, we've talked about the efficiency of your battery, but what's the lifetime of your battery like? Well, flow cells are known to have a long battery lifetime due to the separation of the electroactive components to the actual cell. So there's no de degradation of the electrodes, there's no side reactions happening, and there's no reactions happening when you don't want them to because of, they're separated. So Richie, what's the lifetime of your battery like? Well, with molten metal batteries, there's not even a membrane like there is in the flow cell. So there's almost no parts to degrade at all. The only issue that they've been having is with the seams to stop oxygen from entering the cell and oxidizing the, any of the metals. But as these progress, they're predicting an 85% charge capacity still after 10 years of overuse which is unprecedented in the world of mass energy storage. So Richie, the biggest problem facing the renewable industry at the moment is the cost of the net technology. What is the cost of your battery life? Well, at the moment, with new battery building technology to look at, um, we're sort of estimating around $250 per kilowatt hour, which is not very close to the aim of about $100 but then there's cheaper running costs and um, the extended lifetime that's predicted of this battery sort of overcomes the current target set for the uh, cost per kilowatt hour because it has the cost of three batteries in it. So Dan, does your battery come underneath the cost per kilowatt hour? Well, the researchers who are developing this battery think potentially they can hit the target of $100 per kilowatt hour, which is the United States recommendation. This is due to the fact they're using cheap organic materials, no expensive metals like technetium, $150, my God. And um, you know, the organic models are not corrosive, they can be stored in cheap container vessels. However, the initial cost will be expensive as there's complicated electronics and systems and pumps, sensors are needed in this. So initially, initial cost will be expensive, but balance out over time. So, so far we've talked about the efficiency of your batteries, their lifetime and the cost. But what's the safety concerns surrounding them and the environmental impact? I'll go to you first, Dan. Well, these organic flow cells are inherently safe due to the fact that someone say the electric active elements are dissolved in are not flammable and not highly frozen. But also, due to the fact that they're stored in separate containers, there's not much mixing between the two um, electrolytic elements and therefore they're not doing any other reactions except the one they're supposed to. Also, there's not much environmental impact of these molecules. Uh, on the if I may, Dan, where are your quinones or your organic electrolytes stored? Well, you see, at the moment they're stored in fossil fuels. Yeah. They're also based in plants, which will probably be the main source once this technology gets running. So I mean, and they're not that 
toxic, which lead is, I think you'll find. And so, and they're using dilute acids as a solvent. So, so Richie, when you explained it earlier how your battery worked, you said it needs to be kept at 700 degrees. How practical is this on a large scale? Well, as the technology moves on, um, with different metal combinations being used, the temperature is coming down, and at the moment, the newer ones are looking at about 500 degrees Celsius. Um, there is a practical element with this, as in, um, as it scales up and the resistance in the battery increases, while still maintaining a 70% efficiency, it becomes self-heating and maintains this temperature through charge and discharge. However, having um, reactive molten metals in your vessel does come with some safety risks. For example, in a natural disaster, if there was an earthquake and the metals were to mix, all the energy stored in the battery at that point would be released at that point. Um, but as the technology develops, these risks can be accounted for. So Dan, what's the practicalities like of your battery on an industrial scale? Well, flow cells are designed to be used on industrial scale, as the storage tankers which contain electrolytes can be scaled up indefinitely to meet massive energy needs. Also, the electrolytes can be replaced quickly when there's a high energy demand. However, at the moment, their power outputs aren't that much better than conventional batteries, so they need to be improved if they're going to be a viable option in the future. So you both agree that your batteries are on the way to becoming a future technology then? Yeah. We began this presentation talking solely about solar power. However, the more research we did, the more we realised that battery technology was the biggest problem facing the industry at the moment. We hope that we have piqued your interest in this area and we need more of you bright students to push the industry forward, allowing enough to, enough to be done in time. If you have any questions, please email the link below and thank you for listening. Hey, are you the free new bath students looking at battery technology? We we're wondering if you were interested in jobs. To be honest, we're just still looking at renewable technology for now. We would sponsor you for the rest of your uni course. Yeah. Edit. So I stop edit. edit. No. <laughs> right. Do I have a complete mug? <laughs> no, it's quite it's quite funny when you're just spoiling that. <laughs> It's right, much better. It's through and forms an alloy with antimony through oxidation, through reduction, through oxidation. Losing electrons, you're confusing me now as well. Yeah, I know. I, I've never, since GCSE, I've always got them mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> Says it all.